Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Purified by Fire. I am David C., and this is the spiritual friendship show to help you find peace, love, and joy in family and work life sanctifying the world one soul at a time. We are here each and every week to help you grow spiritually, become successful in this life, and to be a saint for the life after. No matter how broken you may be, God is calling you to greatness that only you can fulfill. So come join us and see how he may be calling you. Hello, everyone. This is David again at the Fairfax Studio. So um, today we're going to be talking about one of the greatest things that um, will make you successful uh, while finding peace and joy in your life and also becoming a saint all at one time. Can you imagine that, being successful as well, finding peace, joy, and becoming a saint? And this topic is about virtue. Virtue is one of those things that not only helps in the secular world, you know, being here in the world, but it also helps out in the spiritual world. If you look at a lot of the uh, Old Testament Bibles and the great stories that there were out there, you'll find that a lot of the Jewish people that worked for, um, you know, other, con- uh, other countries when they were taken over or whatever, they were very successful because they were virtuous, okay? The virtuous man will always be very successful, well, and it really doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. So in the second world, virtue really helps out. But, we're, but as Christians, that virtue can not only help us in the, in the secular world, but also helps us in the spiritual world. So today, we're going to be talking about virtue. And quite frankly, the next couple of uh, uh, topics, next couple of uh, Fridays, we're going to be talking about the individual virtues, especially the, uh, the cardinal virtues, um, possibly the theological, but really I'm going to go over more of the cardinal virtues and then some special virtues that I want to go over that are really important uh, to make a person holistic. So before we begin with our story, I'd like to first start out with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we come together another day with Purified by Fire, where we listen to um, your word, your theologian, the traditions of the Catholic Church, and help us to grow in work, in our family, as well as in your love. We pray, O God, from whom all good things come, grant that we who call on you in our need may at your prompting discern what is right, and by your guidance do it. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to share a story with you that was very impacting uh, to me. So it's a personal story about me. Now, um, I'm not claiming that I'm holy or I have a sense of gift of prophecy or anything like that, but um, in my, since my you know, conversion to the Catholic Church, I've personally uh, heard God, maybe through angels or whatever, Um, talking to me. Um, Hopefully you won't think that as weird or anything like that, but three occasions God has, um, you know, I've heard a physical presence, someone talking to me inside of my my soul very clearly, very distinctly. Um, And I wanted to share this one story about uh, my experience with with virtue. So I want to say maybe, uh, I would say 12, 13 years ago, um, in the early 2000s, um, I uh, wanted to really focus on the virtue of patience. Uh, growing up, I had, uh, since my teenage years and all the way up and even to this day, um, I typically have anger management issues. And at that point, I had really bad anger management issues. And I had two children at least, and I think a third one um, I w- was coming. 
And so I really wanted to have patience. Um, so one day um, I said to myself, you know what? I am going to really flood the gates of heaven with prayer for patience. That's what I'm going to do. And so I went on a prayer campaign for three whole months for patience. I did novenas. I was the Our Fathers. I offered up rosaries. I did all these things for three whole months. And I figured I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep praying for patience, keep praying for patience. So, you know, as, as time went on, I got worse and worse. I was getting more impatient. Um, you know, I'd be yelling at my kids, yelling at my wife, yelling at work, um, just screaming, and you know, people would do things, and it would annoy me even more. And the harder I prayed, the worse I got, and it, and it kept going over. The more I prayed, the more I, the worse I got. So probably after three months, um, I was praying in front of the cross, and uh, we, I used to, at that time, we had a, a little light at the cross, and. Um, I used to kneel in front of the, the cross, so it was kind of dark, but uh, this light is shining on the cross. And I'm kneeling there, and I am very, very angry. And that's how impatient I was. I was actually angry at God, extremely angry at God. And I basically said, you know, God, in a very angry tone, I said to him, God, you don't care about me. That's what I told God. I said, I, you do not care about me because I offered up all these prayers and you did not give me any, you know, um, you did not give me the virtue of patience. And I was just so angry. I remember just saying, you, you know, literally just screaming at him, saying, you don't care about me. You, you don't love me. And I, I guess I was so worked up that um, I, was, I, I kind of fell into this little slumber. Not asleep, but I just like laid down. And all of a sudden, I heard a little voice in my head uh, saying, what makes a father great? That's what it said. God, almost every time he, he talks to me, you know, again, there was only three times, he typically answers my question with a question. Um, and that's what he does. He always answers my question with a question. And so when I heard that question come out, I started laughing. You see, I was reading a lot of books about God the Father. And so when he asked that question, what makes a father great, I knew what his answer was. His answer was the fact that what makes a father great is when he can teach his children to do something. Not to do it for him. Not to do it for their children, but to teach their children. What makes a teacher great? Because they can do the homework for their, their students? No. So they can teach the students how to do their homework and so that they can do the homework themselves. Same thing with the father. What makes a father great is not that they can do it for their children, but they teach their children so they can do it for themselves. That's what makes a great father and so he answered that one question with a question that he was teaching me. He was teaching me. And he followed up with that little voice that says, I'm giving you the lessons every day. So in other words, what he was saying was, when I was praying for patience, he was creating opportunities for me to practice and exercise that virtue of patience. I was looking at it that, and I was failing. I, I, was, I kept getting yelling and screaming and more and more. That's why, that's why I kept yelling and screaming more and more. He was just giving me those opportunities for me to succeed. And I kept running away because I wanted God to do it for me. And so God answered my prayer with a question. And so that is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about virtues. Because that is what makes us holy. We sometimes ask for certain things from God. And he answers our prayers in a totally unexpected way. So virtues is the topic today. You know, how can we, you know, what is it? How can we acquire it? Why do we need it? All that. So the first question we like to ask ourselves is, you know, why the virtues? Why are the virtues so important? 
okay? Um, because if you don't understand well, why you need to uh, attain these things, then you are, in essence, not going to really do much of anything, right? So most people, most uh, people want to know why so that they can go and um, uh, achieve it. If they don't buy into the why, then most likely they're not going to do that. So the first reason why is, and the most, one of the important things is, it brings real peace to a person, peace and joy. If you really want to find peace and joy, then seek the virtues. Seek them. Because that's what's going to um, give you that peace and joy. You see, the reason why most of the time we're unhappy is because our will is controlled by our senses, the five senses, touch, smell, hearing, whatever it is, those five senses, which then um, control our passions because our passions are then striving to find the best smelling place or the best tasting food or, uh, you know, um, they can't stand annoying things and everything else. So that our passions, so those two things, the senses, external senses, and our passions are then controlling our will. And our will then is driven by these erroneous things and you can't avoid the suffering. Because our external senses wants to avoid suffering. That's what it wants to do. Okay? And it drives our passions to, to seek that. So two things it's trying to do is run away from suffering and seek pleasure. That's what our senses are trying to do. And that's what our, that drives our passions. And no matter what, you can't be 100% seeking pleasure and you can't be 100% seeking avoiding uh, uh, suffering. So by putting, you know, so all of these things make our lives all unhappy. You know, um, I, I, every day I'm, I'm talking to my kids, say, oh, that's so annoying. Oh, that's so annoying. That's, oh, that's so annoying. And they say that because they're following their senses. You know, oh, the food doesn't taste good, so that's annoying. Oh, that sound is annoying. Oh, all these things. So virtue conquers, it, 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 it conquers those senses and then conquers the passions. Now, I'm not saying that the senses and the passions are, are evil. It's, you know, it, it's just that when they control the will, we talked about this, it causes a lot of problems. And when the will yields to the passions and those senses, it will never be satisfied. Our will must be um, uh, following reason, the intellect. The will and the intellect should be in sync with each other. So that's what causes us angst. The other thing, the reason why we're not uh, at peace is because we are full of emotions, right? Uh, a lot of our decisions are based off of emotions. Now, we're not saying emotions are evil or bad, but when it comes down to you know using judgment based off of emotions or making decisions or, or doing actions based off of emotions, maybe we're really attracted. You know, I remember um, you know young people who might be attracted because they have this emotional tie as opposed to reason. You know, it, would this man or this woman make a good husband or wife? as opposed to just, oh, I'm so attracted to the beauty of this person, okay? So um, when decisions and actions are based on emotions, all right, um, and, I, and I don't want to go into deeper, but we all, we've done that, made decisions based off emotions. In fact, as a, as a uh, businessman, you know, uh, the first thing that makes people buy is emotions, you know? In fact, you can, you can read all the selling tactics of businesses, and the first thing they tell you is emotional buy is the best buy because they don't use reason. You know, so that just tells you the power of emotions and how it makes people go. So they don't use the reason and logic. And a lot of times our emotional decisions, I would say at least 50% of the time, are not the best decisions. So that's something. Um, the third is that it reduces anxiety. Now, it kind of ties in with, with emotions, but, you know, the devil does play with our mind, creating anxiety and worries that might not even exist. You know, they're just hypothetical. 
That's all they are. And so what happens is if we really use our emotions um, correctly, sorry about that, um, if we you know, reduce our emotions um, and level it with virtue, then what happens is that it will uh, be a way of, of not making these emotional buys, not being in anxiety. Um, you know, a lot of times people who are emotional uh, have high anxiety um, and worry that when, they, when you have a level of virtue, it will allow them to um, calm themselves down and say, that's not really reasonable, okay? So that's what it does. It brings real peace, okay? The second thing is a virtuous person becomes a shining example. You know, uh, they, they really do. Uh, they become a very shining, good, shining example. The virtue begins the road to perfection and keeps us from committing mortal sins. That, that is so important to understand. The, the begin, uh, that virtue is the road to perfection. You see, people try to seek perfection most of the time. They read about it and they're like, oh, wow. What happens to a lot of Catholics is they tend to read a lot about you know, contemplative prayer and meditation and, um, you know, a perfection. And they, they go and they try to seek all this when they haven't even done the first part, which is seeking virtue. You know, a lot of those writings presupposes that you're injecting some virtue inside in there. Because if you don't do that, then what happens is your prayer life becomes an emotional wreck. Your prayer life becomes, you know, some days I feel like praying, sometimes I don't feel like praying. Uh, one of the things as a Franciscan church here we have to do is we have to pray the liturgy of the hours, morning and evening prayer. And, you know, there's times where I do not feel like praying those prayers. But a virtuous man or woman will pray those, okay? Uh, there's certain other prayers that we have to do. There's certain penances we have to do. Uh, not have to do, but we, we, we do. So if you're always in a, an emotional state, you won't be able to, um, to, to do them regularly. Um, I don't know how many people who, who try to meditate, they're all excited and they meditate and, they, and God gives them a little grace and they feel like, wow, I'm in power. This is great. They feel excited. And all of a sudden, the little grace that God gives them fades away and then they feel like as soon as a little dryness period comes in they just fade away and so you know all of this presupposes virtue so you can't seek perfection you can't even meditate well unless you have a level of virtue I want to read you something from the Bible this is, comes from 2nd Peter's chapter 1 verses uh, 1 through roughly 9 says his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called to us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our leader, Jesus Christ, oh, sorry, for whoever lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten that he was once cleansed from his old sins. So what it's clearly saying is that we have to supplement our faith with virtue because virtue leads us to all of these things like knowledge. You know, if you're just full of emotions and you're reading it for certain other reasons, then you're going to pick up a book and then not, and then not finish it uh, and all, all these things. You're going to start praying but they never consistently do things. Um, you know, and yet you have to. 
Because as soon as a little dryness comes in, people start fading away. As soon as a little uh, suffering comes in because of their faith, they run away. You know, as soon as a, a certain temptation comes along, they run away. So that's what virtue does. It helps us to fight our sins and is the beginning of the road to perfection. So uh, that's important. Number five, you know, it is the virtue is the catalyst of change to become a saint. And I'm going to talk about that, how important the virtue is to becoming a saint uh, down the line. Number six is this, grace perfects nature. Grace perfects nature. So you have to have virtue to have what we call heroic virtue. All right? Heroic virtue is that uh, is basically natural virtues that is perfected by grace, which elevates it to a greater virtue than, um, than just natural virtues. I want to read you something from a book called, um, this is Father Marin, uh, Christian Perfection. Uh, he's a Dominican, well, uh, he's, he's passed away, but he's a Dominican, and he's taught at the Angelicum back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, I believe in the 70s as well. Um, but a very good book. I highly recommend it. Um, and it says here, but how are the infused virtues, so there's two types of virtues, infused and natural virtues or acquired virtues, united with the natural faculties or powers to constitute with them one principle of operation? To answer this question, it is necessary to bear in mind that the infused virtues are meant to perfect the natural faculties or powers by elevating them to the supernatural order. Consequently, the supernatural virtuous act will proceed from the union of the natural faculty with the supernatural virtue which perfects it. As a vital act, it has its radical power in the natural faculty which the infused virtue essentially completes by giving it the power for a supernatural act. Hence, every supernatural act springs from the natural faculty or power precisely as informed with the supernatural virtue. So in other words, he, what he's saying is that this, this heroic or supernatural uh, virtue springs from the natural virtues. So if you don't have that natural virtue, they can never become that supernatural virtue. So grace perfects nature here in this case. That's what, what he's saying. So it springs forth from it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. So those are why you need to have the virtues. To be at peace here in the world, it really brings a lot of peace. I know that um, you know, uh, even when I was converted, I was still not at peace. And that's because you know, I, I, I'm a very emotional type of a person and I'm trying to control my emotions and everything that goes on will, uh, is, is difficult without seeking the virtues. And so when you focus on it, it's a proactive way of focusing to become helpful. And one thing I'm always about is proactive way of becoming a saint and succeeding, okay? Um, a lot of times people focus on what I call the negative aspect. Oh, I, I, I know, I, I, I can't be impatient. You know, I've got to stop being impatient. i got to stop. That methodology doesn't work. i got to stop being angry or i got to stop, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, pornography or i got to st- That methodology doesn't work. It's called the negative approach as opposed to a positive approach, there are things that we should be doing, okay? I have to, you know, I, may, uh, I have to practice the virtue of patience. I have to uh, use my time wisely, all right? Um, I have to be, you know, worried about be industri- practice the virtue of industry. So, those are positive things that we should be doing. And by doing the positive things, it will negate the negative things. That's what it will do. So if you're focusing on being patient and exercising that virtue, then eventually being impatient will be eliminated. All right? But when we just say, oh, I want to stop being you know, impatient, I want to be, you're not doing anything 
to proactively uh, stop that behavior. So very positive way of changing who you are and doing that. So the next question is, what is a virtue? What is, what is a virtue? Well, simply put, a virtue is a good habit as opposed to a bad virtue. I mean, uh, not a bad virtue, but, but a vice, which is a bad habit, all right? So we are um, all, we grow, uh, it, it, when, we, when we were born, some virtues came very easy to us. Some virtues have become very hard for us. Uh, our disposition, our personality types, our experiences formed and deformed us. Okay? We are either lacking or we have too much okay, of something. And so perfection perfects us that we need to – virtue actually allows us to balance everything out in our personality. So but I want to clarify a little bit about vices. So vices we talked about are bad habits, okay? And um, the one thing I want to emphasize about a virtue is that a virtue is a very balanced behavior, all right? If we were to look at, you know, a seesaw, seesaw has, you know, it, it either bends on one side or bends on the other, or it can be perfectly balanced, okay? So a virtue is actually a perfect balance, all right? So if it's not perfectly balanced, then it becomes a vice. So, for example, a deficiency or excess of a virtue, too much of this virtue, is just as much of a vice as not enough of that virtue. All right? So it's kind of like, you know, the great analogy of that is like water. Too much water, you're going to drown. All right? We have floods and people drown and they die. Not enough water, we have a drought. And that drought, also you can die because you're dehydrated and eventually you, are, um, you, you don't have liquids to survive. So too much water, not enough water, both will kill you. But enough water, a balanced amount of water is cleansing. It's, it washes you. It washes the clothes. And it heals you, cleans wounds, uh, does uh, all these things. Um, it also feeds you or for drink, for cooking, use it. So that's where we want to be at. We want to be in the balance. So remember, a vice, a bad habit, is either excess virtue, meaning too much of it, or not enough of it. So a virtue is the well-balanced. Uh, it's well-balanced. Okay, the next thing we have to uh, know about a virtue is you know, it was surprising to me when I started reading about the saints that what constitutes the declaration of a saint, okay? There is one, so when, when saints, when, when the um, Rome investigates whether a person should be a saint or not, they, they do a, a huge investigation. And there's one thing that a, all saints have to have to be declared a saint. They have to have this feature while they were living, okay? Uh, while they were living, they have to have this feature. If they don't have this feature, they will never be declared a saint. And that feature is heroic virtue. It doesn't matter whether they had such great infused knowledge, you know, and they spoke all these things. It doesn't matter if they wrote articles and articles in the Bible or theology, or if they did great works, or if they did um, you know, uh, great healings, or they had stigmata, or whatever it is. The one thing they have to show is that they had heroic virtue. That is what they have to have when they were living. So, so um, and the only way you can obtain heroic virtue is by first practicing and obtaining the natural virtues. Because as we mentioned before, grace perfects nature. And in this case, uh, the natural virtues um, are, uh, begins the supernatural uh, or heroic virtues. All right? So um, that is uh, heroic virtue. 
Uh, so there's two types of virtues that are out there. There is the natural virtues, which are sometimes referred to as acquired virtues, all right? And um, the second one is called um, uh, infused virtue or, um, you know, or, um, you know, sometimes they're called uh, heroic virtue. So the natural virtues are those that, um, that we can just acquire ourselves and just exercise. That's why call they're called acquired virtues, that we, we can acquire very easily. Uh, the, the infused virtues are those virtues that are el- that elevates the natural virtues, but are enlightened by supernatural knowledge. You know, through grace, through grace, we are uh, there. So, so what, what, what does that mean? That means that only Christians who are in a state of grace can obtain super infused virtue or heroic virtue or supernatural virtue is called, all right? Everyone, regardless of whether there are Christians or not, okay, can obtain the natural virtues or the acquired virtues, all right? In fact, um, I, I, I employ um, international employees here. They're from China or they're from, from um, India, and I see their virtuous life. In fact, most uh, Indians and most uh, Chinese uh, have such great virtue. Uh, they, they far exceed American in that category. Um, so, so, so anyone can obtain a natural and acquired virtue, but there's only Christians who are in the state of grace that can elevate that natural virtue to infused virtue, heroic virtue. So I want to, want to read something from, again, Father Marin and Christian Perfection. It says, the principal element of specific differentiation between the acquired and the infused virtues is that by reason of the formal object, the infused virtues, dispose the faculties to follow the dictate or command, not of simple reason, as do the acquired virtues, but of reason illumined by faith. The motives of operation for the acquired virtues are simply, simply and solely natural motives. The motives for the operation of the infused virtues are strictly supernatural motives. Hence, the great abyss that separates the one from the other set of virtues by reason of their formal object, which is the most characteristic element of the specific differences in the definition. So what, he, what, what Father Marin is saying is basically... <clears throat> that the, the difference between natural uh, virtue and infused virtue is the object and the motivation of that object. In the natural virtue, okay, the motives are purely natural. Okay, maybe it's, I want a better job. Maybe I want uh, to get good grades. So I, I practice these virtues. Maybe I want to be a great athlete. Um, while in the uh, supernatural infused virtue, the motive is godly. You know, it's for the love of God. It's the love of neighbor. It's that which takes the, um, to the infused virtue. The true love, theological love, you know, theological faith and understanding of God comes from grace. Okay? So it's that illumination of faith. Okay? that we received, right? Uh, when we were baptized, we, we were given that illumination of faith, all right? So, so that's the biggest difference. That's what differentiates between natural and acquired, the motivation. But the motivation is brought about in the infused virtue by uh, the illumination of, the faith, of our faith, okay? So that's why... Uh, grace is so important. That's why baptism is so important because we cannot be illumined by faith without baptism. So we would be, if we weren't baptized, we'd be limited just to the natural uh, virtues, okay, instead of the supernatural or infused virtue or heroic virtue. And that is the goal. That is our goal. All right, so you say to yourself, what's the difference, okay? The difference is this, okay? And the cross exemplifies this. So 
we as human beings can naturally be patient. Okay, I can naturally be patient with my children. I can be naturally patient with my wife. But heroic virtue is the cross. All right? When you're literally, you know, suffering the pains of scourging and crowning and nailed to a cross, and you can still, you know, say with patience, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. That's heroic virtue. All right? It's, you know, we could all naturally be patient, but we elevate that to that level where you can forgive someone and such when they have crucified you, then that is heroic virtue. Now that doesn't mean that we are doormats. That's not the that's not the element that we're you know, a lot of people think, oh, I must forgive and that's what's gonna No 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 no. He's doing it because he knows that is the way of salvation for his, his neighbor. You know, there's a lot of times where Jesus, you know, uh, yelled at the Pharisees, you know, um, and called them and basically, it cursed them. You know the woes, the, the seven woes of the Pharisees. So it's not that we're called to be doormats because there's times to be angry and times not to be. But the point here is that the the cross, he willed that cross, and he patiently endured that suffering because he knew that was the only way to catch the um, uh, the attention of human beings. So he willingly chose that. So it's not that we're doormats. Okay. In fact, that well, Christians are never doormats. All right. Um, it's that we're, we, but through that heroic virtue, we can elevate natural patience to supernatural patience by suffering even greater. Okay. Um, so uh, that's that's an example of the difference between natural and acquired virtues. The the uh, the other thing is that. Um, uh, it helps us to keep going when we don't feel like it, okay? So when we don't feel like it, the virtues help, they kick in. Virtues become like our keel in our lives. That's what happens, that we're not tossed and turned by the storm of emotions, by our passions, and by our, our senses. Um, the other thing about uh, virtues we got to understand, all of us have you know, virtues that we were born with, some that we just come naturally to us. You know, um, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, I look at my two sons. One son, he has, uh, you know, he just is gifted at um, being patient and detail-oriented, um, you know, meticulous. Um, you know, my other son, he has more fortitude. Um, but again, the problem that we face is that too much of something becomes a hazard, just as much as not enough of it becomes a hazard. The other thing we got to know about virtue is how do I know if I mastered the, the, the virtue? Now, if we're acquiring these virtues, how do I know I mastered it? Well, the best way is that if that virtue is exercised without you doing, without you thinking about it, then I can guarantee you that you've mastered that virtue. So, you know, um, so for example, um, the virtue of justice. If a person sees a wallet full of money and he has to think about whether to give it to the person or keep it, let's say it had, you know, $500 in the wallet and he finds it on the street and it clearly has a name on it. You know, David Cease, this wallet belongs to David Cease. Here's my phone number. And the person has to sit and think and say, well, you know, I could keep the money. I could, or, you know, well, that's, he's not practicing the virtue of justice. He is just, he has to think about it. But a virtue is acquired when he can pick up that wallet and say, oh, I wonder who owns this wallet. Oh, it's David. Here's his phone number. Let me call him. That's when you've mastered it. When you don't have to think about it. Because it's habitual. Okay, the last thing and, and one of the most important things about virtue is that you can't learn virtue. You can't acquire virtue through learning. Okay? I don't care how much you study about patience. I don't care how much you, you read about it. 
someone teaches you about it, you can't acquire that virtue until you exercise it. That's so important for you to understand is that you cannot do that. You have to actually exercise uh, that virtue. Um, you know, there used to be a common saying out there that says, you know, when, when people used to get impatient, someone used to always say, practice the, you know, practice the virtue of patience. Practice the virtue of patience. That's exactly what that means. We practice or we exercise that virtue to acquire it. That's the only way we can acquire a virtue is by exercising it. So it, it, you acquire through experience. But what's the thing that happens? A lot of people don't want to experience it. A lot of times what, pe- what tend to happen is people run away from, uh, from acquiring those virtues because they don't want to admit they have those types of, the, those types of, um, of deficiencies. But even more importantly, what happens is even worse. Society, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, about the three enemies of the soul, but typically society distorts, okay, distorts um, ourselves because some virtues, society really looks at it as it really makes a successful person. And we'll go about that when we talk about the three enemies of the soul when it comes to the virtue. So the but the, but the point I'm trying to get at is you have to exercise that virtue to acquire it. Even if you're good at something, if you don't exercise it, you're still not going to be as good as someone who does exercise that virtue. So you've got to exercise it. That's the only way you can acquire it. And that's our, our, our mission, in a sense, is to acquire these virtues. But that doesn't mean that we have to purposely put ourselves in uh, danger or harm's way or extreme conditions for us to acquire it, but it does mean that we do need to experience it and test it and exercise it to acquire it, okay? Because um, no way am I encouraging you to do like, oh, I have to, you know, exercise the, the virtue of fortitude, so I'm going to go and do crazy things, you know, I don't know, join the uh, army because I just want to uh, do that. No, that's not the case. Or jump off of a building, you know, bungee jumping or something. Uh, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that, you know, um, you don't have to do that, um, okay? Because there's plenty of opportunities in our life to exercise those virtues. That's the neat thing about running a business. I run a business, and I love it that I have great opportunity to exercise my virtues, patience, uh, humility, um, you know, uh, poverty of spirit, I mean, joy, uh, all these things that I have to exercise to run this business. In fact, uh, I have gained so much. Okay? So it's important that we, we acquire those. So what are the three enemies of the soul? The three enemies of the soul, of course, we know, is the world, the devil, and the self. The biggest impact to our seeking the virtues the enemy is the world and self, the, the devil. But here are some things about the world and how they prevent us from uh, being perf- seeking perfection and the right virtues. The number one thing that the enemy does, the, wor- the enemy of the world does, is they like to exaggerate and hyperextend our best virtues. Okay. I say to people, and this is, I say to people, our strengths become our weakness when our weakness cannot control our strength. Think about that. Our strength become our weakness when our weakness can't control our strength. So let's say, you know, our strength is fortitude. You know, strength, courage. All right, we have this great courage. But if we don't exercise, let's say we don't have good prudence, we can use those courageous ideas to do some crazy things. You know, that's what a lot of people are doing. A lot of people are doing all these extreme sports. You know, MMA, where people are literally beating each other to a pulp. Okay? And that cor- courageousness 
and that you know drive to beat someone up. Okay, that's basically what it is. Is that true prudence? I'm joining a sport to hurt another person. Now, I'm not saying that sports there's no violence in sports. I mean, football, you know, has you know they're hurting each other, but that's not the objective of the game. The objective of the game is to move the ball from one goal to the other in football. And it happens that the people have to block, and you know there's protection, there's you know, and the best we can protect in that sport. But the objective of MMA is to hurt the other person. That's the objective. Is that true prudence? Okay. So uh, I'm just giving one example. So what what society does is it, it it does that with sports, where they harness the power of aggression, power of uh, of all, you know, type of A, drive there to do what? To win a game at the end of the day. And meanwhile, they're lacking other virtues, uh, maybe justice. So it makes us lopsided. And again, when a virtue is too much, it becomes a vice. At work, we see that all the time. I, know, I don't know how many times it is that... Uh, we, we've gotten society to be so highly functionalized that we really like to harness the power of one person that is very good at something. You know, someone who it might be borderline OCD. They, they can do the same thing over and over and over again. They keep making them do that, that thing that they're very good at. All right? And so that's all they become. They become very myopic in their virtue as a, opposed to well-balanced. You know, you have a type A personality that loves the drive, loves the motivation, they love that adrenaline, that emotion. You know, they become firemen, police officer, whatever. And all of a sudden, they love that, that adrenaline that pumps through. Okay? So uh, um, it, it, society tends to make us uh, lopsided. And the, and the world will basically glorify that. So that's an, one of the things that the world does. It exaggerates and hyperextends our best virtues and glorifies it to the detriment of our own well-balanced life, our well-balanced uh, anything. So um, overemphasis on passion and emotions. Virtue is very reasonable. It's about reason and logic and controlling our passions. But when you, wa- when you watch movies or when they keep saying, oh, it's all about your passions and your emotions, then, of course, um, they're not going to be emphasizing, you know, uh, the virtues. Uh, movies and televisions, they rile up our emotions. Now, I have a close relative of mine who, who, growing up, was the most virtuous man I could ever think of. But in his older, older years now, he is watching a lot of television, the news especially, and he's getting all emotional, all riled up because the news is making him all riled up. And so this is what's happening. Um, so this is what the world can do with, with television is you know, fuel our emotions and our passions. Uh, virtues are not taught, just simply neglecting the idea of virtue. Uh, the idea that regimentality is bad, you know, a virtuous man is usually regimental, you know, uh, uh, leading to worldly solutions. I mean, a lot of uh, the issues that we face today is that we don't teach our kids a virtue. What we do is we medicate them. Oh, you're, you're ADHD, you're, you have this problem. You, so we medicate them. You know, I saw that in prisons a lot where they medicate them. Because it's easier to sedate people and their behaviors than to teach them the virtue and, the pa- and being patient with them. Um, justifying behaviors. Um, blame others of their behaviors. Um, now another thing is they pit one virtue to another, uh, making, let's say, justice more important than prudence. You know, how many times, you know, the idea of vigilante, you know, like, oh, I got to, you know, uh, you know, uh, seek justice for my family because someone, you know, killed my mother or something like that uh, over prudence okay, or maybe over the virtue of love. Um, and then all, distorting virtue in a sense of redefining what virtue is. So that's the enemy of, of the world, uh, the world as being the enemy of the soul. We got to be very careful of that. 
so the second is the devil. You know, what, what, what he's, again, he's about failure. Failure, a failure to keeping, keeping try, keep trying to do the virtue because you think that you're a failure. But the one thing that he does is I call it the two-one punch. He tempts you with vainglory, right? Oh, you could be the best entrepreneur. You could make so much money if you did that, if you did this. And they tempt you and get you all riled up about being the best entrepreneur, the best sports, the best athlete, and you can make it to the pros and all this other stuff. And then it comes with the ultimate. And then once you, once you start trying to be that great entrepreneur or trying to be that great athlete or trying to be that big businessman, and you know that you know, it takes a lot of effort and work, then he seeps in the doubt. The doubt that you can't do it, and then eventually fear, fear that you just failed. Okay, um, all of that giving you that emotional anxiety, um, and that's what he does. But the first way he does it is by, you know, uh, by vainglory. Oh, look at this! You can do that, and you, and you fall on the trap. That's why if you practice the virtues, you can just tell Satan, "Stop, stop right there. That's ridiculous." I might be a good baseball player, or I might have some good common sense of being a businessman, but I'm not going to be the next Bill Gates or the next, you know, uh, Steve Jobs. All right. Um, and so, um, you know, and not only that, but reasonably speaking, I don't want to be that. I want to be enough to support my family and live a peaceful, joyful life with my family and with God. So that's what, what's going to happen. He's going to tempt you. He's going to instigate your passions and your senses. That's what he's going to do. He's going to instigate those through your memory and your imagination. <clears throat> he's going to say, oh, look at how great you can become. You know, maybe you read a book, you know, Good to Great, how you could be this great, you know, businessman because now you've read the seven, you know, and I'm not saying these books are bad. I'm just saying all these books put in this mind that you can now become this great businessman or this great entrepreneur. And Satan's just going to take that knowledge and make you think in vainglory about now I could be five or ten or twenty or thirty million dollars without truly understanding. It takes a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice. I mean, a dire sacrifice. And then we try to do that, and you realize that now you become a big failure. But if you have virtue, you're going to be able to temper his temptations with solid reason and facts so the self uh, you know the self is probably the, the second worst enemy in this is that you know uh, a lot of times it's pride they don't want to they don't want to see their vices they don't want to see that and or they over glorify their virtue that has made them succeed you know um, you know, I look at, uh, you know, what I can do um, and all the virtues I have that have made me a success. So, I, so it's very easy for me to say, that's why I only am good, because I only see my, the good virtues. But fortunately, with humility, you get to see that you, you have good virtues that God has given you, and yet vices that you need to work on. All right? So pride. Pride, basically saying, I don't want to see the, my, my vices. Or I, and I just want to see my over-glorified, uh, quote, virtues that make me great. Uh, crush mentality. So many people have this idea that, you know, I can live this distorted, viceful life, and then I just go to confession and spill all my guts out and, um, and not change. That's called a crush mentality, using religion as a crutch, as opposed to, no, religion, uh, the Catholic Church is here to heal you help you overcome your weaknesses um, ignorance and misunderstanding not knowing about the virtues okay uh, um, you know some a lot of people they love the theology but when it comes to actually exercising that they're like oh, I don't want to do that because it's better to to get bask in the glory of no oh wow that guy really really knows a lot of theology as opposed to no that guy really is holy and he is patient kind gentle loving you know so that's what happens uh, so they purposely become ignorant because they don't want to change they just want to keep reading theology so that they can sound all you know uh, knowledgeable um, and smart and brilliant 
uh, laziness. At the end of the day, virtue, as I said, you have to acquire it through action. And it's frustrating. It's very frustrating, you know, especially in the beginning. So, um, but they don't want to do that. You know, it's the guy who says, you know, the, you know maybe the uh, overweight person who's watching television, eating potato chips, and he sees this, you know, guy who's fully fit, muscular, and he says, yeah, I wish I could do that. And as he's eating his potato chips and drinking his soda, sitting on his couch, and then switching the channel to watch a movie. It's that's not it. You know, we don't just read about all this and say, "Yeah, that'd be great if I was a saint," but that's not me. Um, no, it, it is you. You you have to um, um, exercise, get off the chair, a couch, and start creating a regimen to seek virtue, which is the great stepping stone to become a great person, both in in the world as well as you know, um, becoming a saint. Um, and then the measure is. Um, the other one is measuring yourself with others rather than saints or objectively all the, the virtues. A lot of times people are, will go, oh, you know, um, uh, at least I'm patient. You know, um, a lot of times everyone looks at their own virtue as their great asset and always measure themselves against another person to see why I'm better than that person because my virtue is better than his virtue. You know, like, for example, my, my son who has strong fortitude, you know, and, you know, might say to my older son who's more patient in virtue, oh, but you're such a wimp. You won't, you won't even, like, talk to other people and converse with them. And conversely, my other son might look at him and say, well, you know, you, you don't even, you know, you're not even patient. Every time someone says something, you explode at them. That's judging other people and measuring them by what you're good at as opposed to measuring yourself against the saint who will, you know, were seeking perfection and a complete well-roundedness of perfection of, of, of the virtues. So measuring yourself objectively against all the virtues or against a saint as opposed to measuring your best trait and character against the person um, and saying, I'm better than that person. So um, that's how, you know, that's the, the enemy of the soul with the self. Now, I'm going to briefly go over, um, you know, and I'm going to probably make the, you know, this a episode all in itself on how to improve using daily examination, conscience, and, and confession. But I don't have a lot of time now because we're close to the hour. But what I'd like to do is just briefly say that, um, the, you know, just three bullets to help you at least start with the virtues. One is pick one or two virtues that you want to work with. Just pick one or two. All right, stick with that virtue for at least three months. It has to be three months. You know, sometimes uh, there's a great tradition in the Franciscans that we do. Uh, it, it's, it's called the, uh, the Epiphany Cards. In the Epiphany Cards, you have a certain saint, it's a Franciscan saint, and uh, it has a virtue that you work on for that whole year. So in our case, we actually work on a virtue, one or two of them, in a whole year. All right? So, but at least three months. All right? Focus on that virtue. Focus on making resolutions around that virtue. Okay? And always make resolutions. Here's the three rules of resolutions. They have to be specific. They can't be, um, you know, general. You know, I will be patient. Resolutions have to be specific, and they have to say what you're going to do, uh, you know, and almost at what time. Okay? So I'll give you an example. So one of the things I was being was impatient with my, my children. Um, and so one of the things I instituted was that I would, um, uh, you know, before I entered into that house, I would say a little prayer and smile and say only good things. So my resolution at that time, not anymore, is that when I come home, because most of the time when I yelled on the screen was that when I came home, because it was a long day of work, is when I come home, I'm going to take one minute to say a quick prayer, calm myself down, smile, and enter that door and only say good things about my children. Now, you can say to me, well, David, what about all the other times, like you know, in the morning or in the afternoon? And don't worry about that. Focus on just doing one thing at a time, and that one period of time. 
that one entrance into injecting virtue at that one moment of time, it will permeate to other areas. Okay? And you'll find that you know, these virtues are tested more in certain times of the day. For example, in the morning, I'm usually very patient in the morning, usually, not all the time, but usually am. But in the evening, I get less patient. Why? Because typically I'm hungry. I just had a rough, you know, I had all day of work. Um, and, um, you know, and I'm used to talking to adults. Now I have to transition into talking to children. So those times I know it will be a very big test of patience at that time. So just pick those things out and do something, again, positive. Again, I will talk about maybe the whole confession and examination conscience, a daily one, to improve somewhere down the line. But the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about the virtues. And uh, next week, we'll be talking about a specific virtue and uh, why this virtue is so important and correct views of virtues as well. Because there's a lot of misunderstandings of what certain virtues are that I would like to go over. So we're at the hour, so let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray. We pray that we constantly seek the virtues, the virtue of faith, hope, and love, and most importantly, love. O oh Lord, let us always seek holiness because of love of you. Let everything that we do, what we say, always be uh, driven by the love of God. We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Bye, Father. I am David Steve. This is the... Thanks for joining us at Purified by Fire. Please visit us at purifiedbyfire.com. Like us at Instagram and Facebook at purified.fire. Sanctifying the world one soul at a time. You can't hear me now. Can't you hear me cry now? As an animal out in the wild, I shout your name into the smile. You can feel it too. Feel the love that I do. Only you can make it right. I shout your name into the eyes. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.